Hey, some of you that don't know me, I'm Gary Ellis. And I'm working as the assistant director of the feeder cattle department under Walt Hackney. Uh, I came in in March of this year, so there is a few of the things that I'm not that familiar with in the feeder cattle department. I worked fat cattle for the organization for about four years. And I was gone two years, and then I come back this year in March and started working feeder cattle again. Uh, some of the things I want to talk about uh, is some of the different ways that we do go about moving cattle through the organization. And I'd say probably the number one way is future contracting cattle. Uh, I want to go into that in a little more detail, so I'm going to start off with regular pricing meetings or ratification meetings and regular weigh-ups and some of their advantages to the smaller producers. We work these weigh-ups a lot in Missouri and the areas where we do have smaller cow-calf herds and this enables us to be able to come up with load lots of the different grades or different sexes of cattle just as if you were one large producer out here with five, six hundred head of cattle. So it is a big benefit to the smaller producers in these areas where they don't have quite as large of ranches and farms or quite as large of cow herds. We do a lot of shipping also in load lots. If you have a load lot of cattle or better and preferably either a straight load of steers or a straight load of heifers, it's possible to move mixed loads, but you have a little more problem than you do if we've got a straight load of steers or a straight load of heifers, why feel free to call them directly into the office and we'll try to move them on that basis. Or if you're sitting in an area where you have a feeder representative uh, that works your area, uh, get in touch with him on it. I have a little bit of a problem right at the present time in the office which we're going to get corrected as far as help and it is a little bit of a problem right now if someone calls in with just a short load of cattle uh, and wants to try to get them moved we really need to try to get a hold of our collection point on this type of a situation uh, get a hold of your collection point tell them what you've got and see if you can get them interested in setting up a feeder way up. If you have any problems, if anybody tells you, well, you know, you're the first guy that's called in or this is going to make me 30 or 40 head and it just doesn't look like, look like we're going to have a feeder way up, then you call me. And the collection points don't work under me, but they work under the volume program and I'll sure get in touch with the volume department and we'll try to get that little situation straightened out. Uh, because we should be able to move any cattle anytime you want to be able to move them and we sure should be getting these points put together where they can move feeder cattle through them all the time. So again, load lots or better or contract cattle you can call directly into the office. I want to go into this forward contract in quite a bit of detail because we have been working on this probably for two weeks out of the office then we came down early Monday evening and met with M.R. Duncan and Joyce Riles and well I'm not going to go through all the names here uh, all of our feeder cattle representatives from across the country and we went through this thing in quite great detail and tore it all apart and put it back together and we want to show it to you today on the board here it's going to be kind of a mess because it's we tried to fix up something we could show on the overhead and some of the fine print doesn't show but we've got the major points in it and a few of the changes in it that we have made so far and the changes we have made in it are actually just to pull the buyers contract and the sellers contract together because we did have some instances last year where they just didn't quite match up and it could have been a basis for some problems. Uh, we was real proud of everybody last year. We did come out of the thing without any problems, really. So we're really proud of the kind of job everybody done. So without going any further on this, I'm going to start in on this 
floor pricing contract. And if there's any questions while I'm going through the floor pricing contract, why well, just raise your hand and we'll try to stop and answer them where we're at or if you want to add something to it, something you think we need in it, why well, stop us also. Uh, and we'll try to get it put in. If some of you people in the back would want to, you can move up this away. I don't know how well you'll be able to see this from back there, so right now is a good time if you want to move up this way. This is pretty well self-explanatory. The sheet that I have on here now is going to be a little bit short, and I'm going to have to add another one on for the bottom of this one because this goes on legal paper, and we don't have a machine down here to put this on legal paper to go on this machine. First part of it is to say it's pretty well self-explanatory, your name, your address, telephone number, membership number. Uh, then you get down into your first section here. Uh, that is the same thing that's been in all of the old contracts, uh, plus your brand number. And then we get into section one here, which we have pulled out the section that used to say immediate sale and immediate delivery, and just left one section in there. Now it was, we figured it was close enough if you were putting cattle down on a contract for a, at a ratification meeting for a current sale, it's going to be a day or two later, so if you want to get right down to fine facts, that's a future sale. So we cut that part out of the contract to kind of shorten it up. Right here, as far as we're concerned, in selling the cattle is probably the most important part of this contract, as far as we, the people who are supposed to sell it, are concerned. Uh, I got a lot of contracts in on this last year that had the number of head blank, 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 blank. And it makes them pretty tough to sell because you don't really know what you're talking about. And that's the first thing you get asked, you know. I've got uh, 428 head of cattle at Pawnee City, Nebraska. And we want to sell them. We want 90 cents for them. And the first thing he says, well, you know, so what? What are they? So it's important that we know what they are. And we do have some problems with this being filled out as to what the cattle are. The estimated grade probably isn't all that important on there as long as we have the sex i would like for the people to go to a little more problem or a little more problem themselves with getting the breed in there if they could mixed is great uh but the mix could be anything so if you go to just a little bit more problem on the part where it says breed rather than just putting mixed, whether they're gonna be black bullies or limousine cross or scimitol cross, I don't think most of the time I'd be particular what they're crossed with as I would just, if they're gonna be English bred cattle or if they're gonna be exotic cross cattle or what they are. This is the first question we're always asked other than maybe what do you think you have to have for them. So, that is very important that we get that down. Like I say, the grade is not that big of a problem. Your estimated delivery weight, whether you contracted cattle this year or last year or not, I think most of you are pretty well aware, regardless of where you sell your cattle, what they normally weigh, and that's about the best thing we can go on. Because there's none of us know right now, before these calves are born, for sure what they're going to weigh next fall. It's going to depend on the weather conditions. But get that as close as you can as to kind of what the cattle done last year. Then your delivery dates, I'm sure uh, about everybody here that's ever contracted is aware of what we do there. We'll normally use a 15 to a 30 day period. The calves could be signed up from, well, let's say November 1st to November 15th delivery of 1980 or November, 15th to November the 30th, or if you prefer a 30-day delivery period, say the 1st of November to the 30th, then what we do within that is when it comes a little closer time to November, we will actually set the delivery day or days, depending on how many cattle are on the contract. Uh, if you've got two, three, five hundred head, probably up to seven, eight hundred head, Cattle can probably be delivered in one day. 
you go to talking three or four thousand cattle through some of these collection points, it's virtually impossible to deliver them all in one day, so we may have a two-day delivery date set up on the cattle. Uh, we've gone in down here, and in the event of a proposed head count is altered by an act of God, winter death loss, sickness, so on and so forth, actual head count will be supplied to the NFO Home Office, Corning, Iowa, by July 1st of that production year. The reason we've done that is we sold several contracts this way last year to the buyer <clears throat> with the understanding that these calves were being sold and they weren't even dropped on the ground yet. So what we were saying was this is a tentative figure of what this producer plans to have next year. Should we run into an extremely severe winter or run into sickness? We had one case in Montana last year where we run into a little uh, brucellosis in a herd and the guy had to sell his whole herd. So that's the reason for this in the contract. As long as we let him know the exact head count by July 1, then we can deliver on that basis instead of the original basis. Now that can be changed, like I say, only strictly due to an act of God. So that clause is in there to cover that. We have that same clause, as I said, in the buyer's contract to cover us on that end. So I have had a lot of questions. Uh, the guys asked me, well, what am I, I can't sign up calves before they're on the ground. Uh, what if they all die, or you know, what if half of them die, or what if three or four of them die? So this clause is in both the buyer and seller contract to cover us in a case such as this would be. Then we go on down here, and the cattle described on this contract are to remain on said premises until time of delivery. In the event said cattle are moved or removed from said premises, the NFO feeder rep who witnessed the seller contract must be notified immediately as to the location of the contracted cattle. And again, the reason for that, the buyer has the option at any time after he's bought your calves and give you a partial payment, he has the, it's up to his discretion at any time if he should wish to look at those cattle, to check those cattle. So it is important that we know pretty well where the cattle are located. Then we get actually into your floor price formulation and it states that these cattle will not be sold for less than We'll say 80 cents on choice steers weighing 400 pounds and 75 cents on choice heifers weighing 400 pounds without prior approval of member. All other weights will be sold on a weight, weight break basis. Now I would suggest at this point and some of your feeder representatives and your blockers, which you should visit with on this in your own area, but I would suggest if you're thinking of selling your calves are going to weigh 500 pounds, you should probably put 500 pounds in there and the price that you'd want on a 500 pound calf, because I have had several of these that were went ahead and filled out at 400 pound calf at 98 cents, you know, and the man was pretty sure he wouldn't have any calves right at that price, that weight range anyway. So I'd prefer if you think they weigh six, you'll put in six weight cattle there and the price you'd prefer on a six weight calf. That's the way we prefer you fill out the price breaks on the contract. The weighing conditions, we're leaving that blank, and this is something that the feeder reps, the collection point people, uh, the feeder cattle blockers, whoever happens to be putting it together, it's very important that they work this out with the people present at the meeting. Because I'd say this would be probably where 60, 70 percent of your problem would come in would be that somebody didn't understand the weighing conditions. So be sure at all your meetings that you've got your weighing conditions down pat on this contract before you send it out, before you have somebody sign it and send it back in. Now right on down on the bottom of this contract for sale, and this part we didn't do a very good job on, bear with us here. Notification of the final sale agreement 
I understand and agree that I will be notified when my cattle are sold and notification of the final sale agreement will become a part of this original contract. The delivery date established will not be changed for any reason other than, of act, than an act of God. Ten days prior to, 30 days prior to delivery, uh, you'll be notified 30 days prior to delivery date and you must have cattle in your ownership that will be delivered on this contract must be in your ownership for 60 days before delivery. So you will be notified 30 days ahead of the day of delivery of this contract and the cattle should be in your possession 30 days. That's got so erased in there I don't know whether anybody can read it or not. Okay, the delivery, okay, okay, it starts out to assure buyers of farm fresh cattle, members must have ownership of cattle at least 60 days prior to delivery date, that's the way it reads. Okay, now after your cattle are signed up on this and turned in to your feeder rep or to your blocker, and the cattle are sold, We'll send one of these back to your feeder blocker. This is a notification of final sale agreement. And this is the instrument that we said in the other one would become a part of the first contract. And what this does, this gives you your breakdown just like it was on your sheet of your number ahead and your price <clears throat> with the following discounts and premiums. Then we've got the base, the base price on the cattle with the following discounts and premiums. Then we go into the total weight breaks by pounds on probably be steers on one side and heifers on the other side. Then we go into any cattle weighing outside this weight range will be price day of delivery to buyer by buyer Seller has the option to reject offer and retain ownership. So we're saying if we've got cattle signed up to 350 to 550 pounds and somebody brings in a 700 pound calf, it will be priced by the buyer. We'll negotiate with our NFO representative on the price of the calf, but it doesn't fit the contract. If you want it to go, why well, we can we can negotiate the price with the buyer there that day, but uh, it will not go at a contract price because we break off the contract price at whatever weight range the calves were written to be and accepted to be by the contract and sold to the buyer at those weights. Other than that, they'll have to be priced day of the weigh-up. Okay, now what we've got in here is exactly a duplication then of what's on the other one. Cattle described in this contract are to remain on said premises until this delivery. In the event said cattle are moved or removed from said premises, NFO feeder rep who witnessed the seller contract must be notified immediately as to the relocation of contracted cattle. Now this instrument will come back with your partial payment to your feeder blocker who will deliver your partial payment to you along with this instrument and you will again sign that you have accepted your partial payment and he will witness it. Do we have any questions on this? Yes. Yes, there's a weighing condition, a place for weighing conditions on this contract right in the center of it there, right below your pounds, your weight breaks. And there's also a place for it on the original contract you first signed.
Right. As I mentioned, I mentioned that earlier when I showed you the first one. Be sure at your ratification meetings on these contracts that you get these weighing conditions hashed out. Because it is something that's very important on the contract. I said I imagine 60 to 70 percent of the problems that might arise on one of these probably would be over weighing conditions not being understood and this type of thing. So keep that in mind. Any other questions on the contract? Yes, sir. Does the buyer have the right to reject this guy if they're not the uh, contract with cattle to buy and he, and he was buying choice cattle and when he got them he didn't think they were choice? Did he reject the cattle then? Well, we normally, most of these contracts I think are written that there is a price off for goods. Now, if it is strictly a choice contract, if we have written a contract that is strictly choice, yes, he has a right to turn the cattle down. In most instances, and most of our contracts are written with a clause in there, so much off for goods. Uh, most of our contracts are also written any cattle that doesn't grade choice. If you wish to, you may take them home. Gary, if that's the case, if I got a question on this, as long as you understand that this is for your approval, before we put it into effect. And my question, and Joyce, you need to help me. Uh, in regards to this gentleman's question, if you, in fact, have sold a set of choice to good steers to a buyer, and that term good means something <coughs> just less than a choice steer, and that is all understood in the buying world, except what happens in regards to this gentleman's contract if he delivers a set of cattle that just aren't acceptable even as goods. Now, my question is, I understand the buyer doesn't have to take them because they don't fit the language of the contract, but my question, what happens to the physical delivery man did not deliver cow per his contract. Now, are we going to then say that he made the effort to deliver and so his down payment remains with him? Or are we going to say that he breached his contract because the cow were not of the context in the contract and he must forfeit his down payment back to the buyer? Or are we going to say that the seller must go out if he retains the contract and replace with uncomfortable cattle. How do you handle that? I've never really had that big a problem. Well, you run into it, but two or three heads, maybe. Uh, you negotiate with your buyer, you know, make an offer on those cattle that are less than good. If the producer doesn't want to sell those cattle, does forfeit his down payment land, okay? Now I know that uh, if, you, if any of you do not know Joyce Riles, he runs the feeder division as a supervisor in the Northwest as a uh, case in point, Montana, Idaho, back around in the Colorado and so forth. Are, are you understanding of, if any of you happen to be from Missouri, Kansas, and South, do you understand what MR just explained? Because that's precisely the way it has to be handled. Yes, sir? Well, I understood, I think, that if you uh, contract a number one or two or three cattle, instead of being a little less than that, then you negotiate it. All right, so you have to have number two cattle. Which do they go up? Or number one is better than two? All right, suppose you have several number one cattle in there. Cattle, if you contract number two cattle, what, 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 what you do, you break your cattle. Number one is which is supposed to be the 
I think. Okay, now see, this is the important thing. Your contracts in those areas certainly need to be written that way, that your number one cattle at such and such a figure and your number two cattle discounted so much from that with number three cattle discounted so much from that. Uh, your contract should be written on number one cattle with a discount for less down the line in grade or, you know, it wouldn't matter. You could write it on number two cattle with a plus and a minus, but it works better just to start with the better cattle and deduct from that. You're asking then, what if the contract was strictly written for number one cattle with number two cattle at a discount and no mention of number threes? In that case, the contract is for number one and two cattle, and a number three calf would be unmerchantable on the contract. No, really, what I was wanting to was trying to say was for your number two calf, if you wrote, wrote your contract for that, if you have better cattle, you would. Yeah, if you had, we don't. Right. Right. That's correct. Okay, back in the back. Did anybody? Yes. That brings a question I'd like to ask. Uh, is there any way that we could sort of change the feeder cattle rating to where we go on a, a, a selling them like we do, like the tall cows on the Anapol, Fletcher Point, Reps, grade? Well, see, really there is, in feeder cattle, it may not be drawed out in quite the terms uh, that it is in hogs or slaughter cattle or cull cows, but there are standards for grading feeder cattle. Uh, and these, you know, we've got to have a standard thing as far as NFO is concerned if we're going to maintain our markets. Uh, this is one of the most important things we have. We've had several areas go through this situation. We've got one area in this situation right now. And until you get a man that can do it grading several points, moving cattle out of those points, it gets to the point where it's impossible to sell cattle out of the points if you've got one man grading the cattle at each point. So you're making loads of cattle or something out of five, six, four points, every one of them graded by a different individual. Uh, you go to putting all those cattle to one buyer and nothing matches, they all clash. And you've got problems immediately. We have any more questions and we have a little time after the meeting while we'll get in a little further to it then. Uh, but without going any further right now, I want to let Walt Hackney come up here and say a few words to you. Walt? Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, 
for your information the the feeder cattle division is at this time held together as well this fall i believe as it has conducted itself for quite a long time there's about three or four reasons for that have had uh, happening uh, one major reason is Joyce Riles, sitting here from Montana, is the supervisor for the feeder division in that country and then around into Colorado, several states, but in that direction. He has a man that works with him, Don M. Sandy, that was sitting at the back of the room. We've got other feeder representatives in M.R. Duncan, in the southern area, which would be Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma. He has a larger area than that, but that's the geographic locations. Now these men, this fall, worked under no leadership whatsoever. In that Dave Miller, who was the director of the feeder cattle division, had become so embedded in the organization that he had let some of his personal holdings and his personal business go by the wayside to the point where he absolutely had to take a grip on his own personal business. And he chose to do that this fall because it was imperative that it would be taken care of. When that happened, Gary Ellis, was in Corning and became the assistant director, but Gary's primary function has been handling the collection point physical deliveries that we're referring to here, which left all of that contract business in the hands of Joyce, Namar, Don M. Sandy, and I'll bet you I've missed somebody, and I apologize for it, I can't look over the crowd and see who else is here. But these men have conducted this feeder cattle program this fall almost to perfection. It was a point of extreme concern to the National Board of Directors and to all of us in Corning about what physically would happen with Dave not involved. But he had done his job well he had coordinated well with these three individuals I'm referring to, and they conducted your business for you with these buyers in the country much, much better than it has been done in the past. A case in point is we have no outstanding monies now on any of our deliveries that I'm aware of. We put out of the home office actually our only involvement was assisting these men on those deliveries in accounting, in helping schedule, in coordinating the deliveries for them if they required the help, if they asked for it. But the function was done by people interested in your program. The problems that created or were created came from disinterested members. The problems came through a certain amount of apathy on the part of some of our feeder cattle shippers. All I'm getting around to saying is you have probably one of the finest crews of feeder cattle representatives working for you of any cattle company in this entire country. I've said this several times, but I really mean it. I know several order buyers in the business today that would come into the Corning office tomorrow morning and would lay out about any price we ask in cash for our member contact list. They would recover whatever they laid out on the first go around trading with you one on one. And you believe that. 
Your forward contact program would not exist, and if it did, it would be down to where the gamble was lucrative for them, and so on and so forth, because you have got to have these men's involvement in properly moving these cattle. That isn't to say that we are infallible. It isn't to say they're infallible. But it is to say that they are as astute in moving feeder cattle as any country cattle buyer or any order buyer that you admire in any of these terminal cities. These men have that exact same qualification with one exception. They're on your side and you're paying them. They're your people to conduct that business for you rather than paying somebody to trade against you. I'm having a little problem of understanding why there aren't more total committed feeder cattle deliverers. Now you can tell me about your problem here and your problem there that created a little bit of, of uh, ill feeling on certain instances. But if you sit in Corning and if you watch the national program as it develops and as I have to watch it, I know what you've got in this feeder cattle division. I know what you've got in these people in this feeder cattle division. I know that any given one of these men I've discussed could walk out of here tomorrow morning and they could go into private business and they could come out and trade again you like they're trying to trade for you and they'd make more money. And I'll guarantee you that can happen. You've got to recognize that this business that we've revolved around to at this time is recognized among any order buying facilities in this country as being one of the major source of supplies of feeder cattle that every feeder order buyer in this country has. They want our business, not because they can shoot you in the foot like they have done in years past and get cattle cheap from you and give the higher price to your neighbor that's a non-member, that isn't it. They want you now because we have men like these I've described that can give them a product that they're paying for and they're willing to buy it from us because they get this consistent volume. And they get that volume in a supply that they in turn can use on someone else or for themselves. Now all I'm asking you to do is recognize that. You ran a popcorn stand years ago and it wasn't worth a damn. You've got yourself a program today that is envied by a lot of people. And if you'll look at some of your competitor farm organizations, you'll find some of them trying to duplicate you. They got a little problem. They can't guarantee the checks. They can't guarantee money. There are rubber checks all over this country as a result of that this fall. And if you have been or are in the feeder cattle communities, you are hearing those stories. You find one in the national farmers. You find me one rubber check where a member did not get paid for what he produced. You can't do it. Joyce Riles made a comment this morning about that very thing. Joyce Riles' total comment was, he has got as many, if I believe, if I'm saying it right, Joyce, he's got as many order buyers coming to him now to put their cattle through his program and he does the members. Why? The guarantee of the money. That's the prime reason. Now, if you're that strong and if you've got that many bucks, why don't you keep them in your own pockets and participate more and get your neighbors and sell them on this program? You see, they're the ones that are selling to that order buyer that's coming back to Joyce and trying to get him to market the cattle through the national farmers. And that's a fact. I believe Joyce, I said it to me two or three times, I heard him commented about it here this morning, and you've got to believe that that's exactly the case. There's areas that we need to do a lot of work in. As, as has been discussed here a while ago, there's no excuse 
for those states that Joyce has, where you have the larger cow herds and you have the consistency of quality and breeding and so forth, there's no excuse that that community can't triple, quadruple, whatever in volume. There's no excuse at all. There is a problem on our part to effectively merchandise the very small producers' cattle collectively put together as an example. Jack Lax is here. He's national director. He's from Arkansas. He's involved in a point there in Arkansas. And it's a problem for us. It is a problem, though, for anyone to handle those cattle. We can do it through sheer volume alone better than they can do it by themselves, but we have got to refine the grading program that this gentleman has been discussing. We've got to refine that grading program down there to make a consistent product for the buyers so then we can get that price up for those people. It isn't insurmountable. It can be handled, and it is going to be handled. We've been talking about it as often as possible here at this convention with Jack and those people in that community. M.R. Duncan is the supervisor in that community, and he is very aware of that problem. But we will handle it. But we must have your total cooperation. When these men go back after this convention, we're going to start ratification meetings for forward contracts immediately. We have got to get those cattle on paper, and we've got to get that price bid on those cattle on paper so we can base this market. If we don't have this thing based by the 15th of January toward the 1st of February, you're going to lose your grip. The feeder market will degenerate if we don't put the base under it soon. When Joyce goes back home, he and I are planning to go to Colorado and conduct the ratification meetings in Colorado. Don M. Sandy is going to handle as much of the Montana community as he can. We have people in the Dakotas that will be called on to assist in these ratification meetings, but they're going to be trained in this new contract. They're going to know what the language has got to represent to the member and to the buyer. And when that ratification meeting is conducted, there's going to be a clean slate when they walk out. But you people have got to set those ratification meetings for us. We don't have the staff, the manpower that it takes to go out to each and every collection point in this country and set those meetings up personally. We've got to have your response on that. When you get the community ready for the meeting, we'll schedule the thing, we'll come in, and we will hold it. But please give us that consideration. You've got the motor in your car. All you've got to do is push on that starter. That's the position you're in. I don't have much else to add except I would say this. I made a, I made a statement to the National Board of Directors about three months ago and I gave them my commitment that the feeder cattle division in this fiscal 1980 would develop 50% more volume than we developed this year. I feel that it is very easily obtained. They sold that commitment I made them to the bank in terms of working capital and so forth. And the banks felt that it was obtainable and extended our credit and so forth under that kind of guideline. It was a gamble that I took. I took it because I've got confidence in my staff. You have got to express that same confidence in this feeder program. You have to. You've got to give these men that cooperation they must have in that community of yours in order to make this feeder cattle lucrative. I also made the statement to the Board of Directors through Devon Woodland that the feeder cattle department in the next two or three years would be the highest income department that the National Farmers Organization have in terms of volume. And I'm comfortable with that statement also. But you people again have got to prove me right. You've got to lend your support to this feeder cattle program. If there's problems, let's talk about it for heaven's sakes. 
Call me or call the man in your Please name. turn the tape over to side Thank number two.